Well, let's talk about bumps in the road. The thing about startups, <laughs> contrary to maybe uh, some of the past few years, it's not always up and to the right. You often don't have everything that you need. You don't have all the people that you need. You start out with some premise and find it doesn't work and need to change. It's it's definitely a winding path to success. Mm-hmm. And more often than not, they fail. Right? So, mm-hmm. And yet you start them again and again. And you I do. invest in them again and again. So <laughs> hope springs eternal. Um, can you talk about some lessons learned about some of the rough times from starting these companies and, and what you've seen either from your experience or your team's experience um, mm-hmm. has made a difference in succeeding? That's just a great question. And, you know, I've, I mentioned before, I've, I'm now on company number 10. Yeah. <laughs> and each of those companies has its own totally independent story. Mm-hmm. And there's almost very little overlap between them in terms of the science and the investors are all different mm-hmm. actually in these companies too, with just a few exceptions. Um, and, and you're right, you know, when you start a company, you're full of enthusiasm, you have what you think is the best idea yeah. you've ever had, you know, and your students are ready to go sometimes. And, <laughs> and inevitably, you know, not everything works out exactly as you, as you plan. And you have to make adjustments along the way Sometimes you have to reorganize your priorities. Mm. And I think the companies that are able to weather the inevitable storms, and some of those storms are technology or science Mm -hmm. storms, others are funding climate storms. Um, At the end of the day, you need to have great people. Mm -hmm. So the team that launches the company, the leadership level, they have to be smart and creative and dedicated with a positive attitude and they have to have the highest level of standards for the science and the scholarship. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, they have to be ready to adapt mm-hmm. and, and change their thinking. And you, so you have to have great people and great science. And then you need great investors mm-hmm. that hopefully can hang with you. <laughs> and it's hard because yeah. you know you're, you have obligations to the people that invest in your funds and you have to deliver returns to them. So you have your own difficult decisions to mm. make. Um, but you know, when things when I feel the magic is when I have an investment team that is has conviction mm-hmm. and really believes that we can make a difference with the company and is willing to kind of hang in there with us even when things don't always go according to plan. So you have to tack and jive and so on <laughs> in the in the sailing parlance. Yeah. Um, but but when you have that, I mean, I've often I've often told my students, especially the ones that are working now in companies with me, when they have their moments of frustration, and for them it's like the first big right. obstacle they've yeah. had to deal with in their life because they're young. I tell them that you know successful entrepreneurship in many ways is a war of attrition, mm-hmm. and I in my mind's eye I picture company founders hanging on the rock wall and one by one the <laughs> rocks are falling out and their fingers you know they're down to their last pinky right. and if you can just hang in Stay there, there. <laughs> and and you know the, the person who can hang in there the longest has has the best chance of mm-hmm. overcoming the inevitable obstacles and finding their way to success amazing and when it happens it's just breathtaking and at the end of the day you know this we help patients and we improve the quality of life for people on this planet. Mm-hmm. And that's our goal. Yeah, it's worth it. Yep, it's yeah. worth it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, when we uh, invest, like, as you know, Genoa exists to lead that first round. So we're often the first capital in, the first institutional capital in, and we're engaging with founders. And we know that uh, we, we know that it's going to get rough. So we talk about that. We also know that. Uh, it, it's almost never the founding CEO who is the CEO who takes the company public mm-hmm. right? or sells the company. It's just a very mm-hmm. different skill set to be that visionary at the very beginning who, without any resources and without even an office, recruits Carolyn Batozzi yeah. and mm-hmm. <laughs> and investors and you know to get going on the journey and kind of pointing at that goal. Right. That's usually a very different skill set than the person who when there's 100 employees needs to then Mm -hmm. think about growth strategy and um, think about uh, uh, pitching to the next round of investors. Mm -hmm. So how have you um, worked with, particularly when your founders are your students or postdocs, how have you seen them go through that evolution and maybe hand off the company to the the baton to the next (laughs) leader for the good of the the institution? Well, I'm, again, thinking through my companies, and I have had students who would help launch the company Mm -hmm. as a co-founding 
scientist and maybe right. a chief scientific officer, not as a CEO. Right. And in every case, I don't think I'm missing any of them, uh, we knew immediately that we needed someone with business acumen um, and especially to launch the company from zero, which includes fundraising, Series A, Series B. You know, we needed uh, somebody who had that skill set. And mm -hmm. scientists, certainly a young scientist who just finished their PhD, does not have that skill set right. yet. So um, I've been very fortunate to have recruited some great CEOs. Some of them was a hard target search. Others kind of fell into my <laughs> lap, you know. And, and in a couple of cases, like with Aldo, yeah. um, I had an, an entrepreneur in residence or an aspiring entrepreneur just yeah. cold call me. Yeah. with, you know, because they someone suggested that I might have a technology Some that is science. the right one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so I've just been very fortunate in terms of um, having CEOs come into my companies and do great jobs. Mm -hmm. And you're right, in, in several circumstances, the CEO that we launched the company with um, transitioned out okay. as the company grew or underwent like a big business transaction. Right. And, and they were all, you know, very, you know, healthy in their attitude about that yeah. process. So it's a really natural, um, natural way of thinking. Very natural, and and same with the the student who's the chief scientific officer. Mm -hmm. That's that's a fine role mm -hmm. for a young, recent PhD when there's three or four people to manage. Yeah. When companies grow and you need to have a much more sophisticated organization, um, sometimes the chief scientific officer on day one is not the right person uh, on year five, right? right. And so, yeah. um, and and. Most of the time, scientists understand when the company needs something different from mm -hmm. themselves, mm -hmm. and they're very gracious about it. So, uh, but and, and these are conversations that are difficult, very and you have to have them. Yeah. And I have had CEOs of my company, not many, uh, one in particular that I can remember, actually give me the lecture about how <laughs> now it's time for you the, to step back you know, and, and let the yeah. company, you know, take its own path and so yeah. on. And, and I hear that, yeah. you know, yeah. so I, I think I'm a pretty light touch, you know, in terms yeah. of academic founders. I but, um, yeah. but, you know, it's, it's certainly reasonable for someone to have a conversation with me that's hard right. for me to hear. A lot of what you're pointing to here is the sort of interpersonal dynamics, emotional awareness and maturity, teamwork that frankly is not really part of the traditional academic scientist training in my experience. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, do you think so? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now the, the training of being that, that kind of star individual uh, yeah. performer, um, mm -hmm. is, is very different from knowing what you're great at, what you're not at and, mm -hmm. and, uh, wanting to work in a team to get to a bigger outcome than maybe one could get to oneself. Yeah. Yeah. I, you could even go so far as to say that the typical academically tracked scientist is yeah. trained not to not be a to. good leader. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're right, that's true. And I think uh, nothing can kill a fledgling company more than bloated egos. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't want them on your leadership team, you don't want them in the trenches, and you don't want them on your board mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. uh, you're right. You want people who are good listeners, mm -hmm. who can understand the room and read the room, and who know how to motivate people to function as a team. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that um, uh, many academics are not trained with that sensibility, but the funny thing is if they were, I think they'd be even more successful. They'd be so good. Yeah, right. <laughs> they'd be even better. We'd do even better academic science. Yeah. We're pretty good now. Yeah. We could be better. Even more powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was there any particular um, training or book or aha moment when you look at your development that that expanded your thinking from individual scientific training to team? Oh, wow. Yeah. I don't know if there was an aha moment so much as I think I learned by observation. Mm. And over the years, I've had the privilege of seeing how people in leadership positions function, mm -hmm. and I've learned a lot from watching them. Mm -hmm. And so um, that started for me even in graduate school and just watching senior mm -hmm. professors, both good and bad, you know, and learning what looks good and what doesn't look so good. And then um, as an entrepreneur, I've had the privilege of working with some very experienced and successful CEOs. Mm -hmm. And I just see how they manage their team and I see how they make decisions and the way that they promote inclusion in the decision-making process. Um, I've seen some that were better than others, and you know I've learned a lot just from watching just people. So, so I don't know that it was like a step function where I went from, you know, not understanding to understanding. But I think I just get better and more. 
I just get more savvy all the time, <laughs> just <laughs> learning from people. I'm not done yet. I think I still have more to learn. That is the nature of science mm -hmm. and being a scientist, right? Is yeah. that hunger to learn and yeah, never stop that's it. Right. Yeah.